Um, I'll start. There we go. The beautiful sound. Um, so cool. Um, I'll start talking a little bit about biome while we wait for people to trickle in. Um, so biome, I don't know actually the, the acronym. So it's like bio, bio inter, interdisciplinary something makerspace. We're basically a makerspace on campus for bioengineers, chemical engineers, so on and so forth. And you've probably heard of makerspaces um, for more CS or more mechanical, but um, they're starting to get better and bi like biohacking is what it's called, in which you don't need a super fancy lab to do a bunch of experiments. And so that's kind of like biomes focus a little bit. Um, one way we're trying to grow biome is with community outreach. Um, so we're doing a bunch of uh, different series for that. One of them is this webinar series in which every week me and Alan will alternate and uh, go over different topics. Um, whether I think last time you did the, uh, is the PI of proteins, right? Yeah. And this, and then a week before that I did a uh, uh, blotting. So it's going to change week from week, just kind of more general bio knowledge. Um, it's not, it's more geared towards kind of like high schoolers to people starting off in college. So undergrads, um, it's not going to be super hard or advanced, but to get people interested in, 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 in biology and kind of get them in our community. And then we're going to continue to grow it. Um, other series we have thinking up is we're going to do a lot of transformations with yeast and make cool bread. Uh, the webinars will go throughout all of summer and probably even continue into uh, school year. So they, they will be pretty much every week for a while. Um, and if you look up and I'll type it in the chat, I don't have their website info, but if you look up UTL at Stanford, they also have other series going on during the school year too. Um, and so, yeah, we'll eventually we'll try to invite guests onto this too. So like maybe if a PhD student wants to share their information, things like that. Um, so that's kind of what this is. Um, Biome in general, that was awesome. Thanks, thank you, Alan. Yeah. And so, perfect. Um, we'll get started here very soon. Uh, if you have any questions about that, just type them in the chat and I'll try to respond as quickly as I can if I have the answer. Um, other things we're looking at, we also work with the iGEM thing, which is a international bioengineering competition. Um, and we do a bunch of research projects that you, you all can maybe even get involved in over the summer if you guys look at them. Um, one of them I know that we're starting to work on, we think it's pretty cool. Oh, I'm forgetting like the, we had a fun title for it but it's like knowing your environment in which if you submit samples to us, we will um, kind of get a, a DNA barcode and try to figure out like the species of your environment based on its DNA and things like that. And so you could go around and, and get like the genetic map of your environment. Um, we're starting that or we're working on starting that. So yeah, there's a bunch of cool projects going on. Um, and so you can check out our website too at biome.bio. Um, and see some stuff there that's constantly going to be getting updated over the summer and throughout the years to come because by them sticking around even when me and alan are long gone it'll be there it's like a great great library just don't burn it down though <laughs> cool. all right it seems like we're at 19 20 people now so if you want to get awesome. started um Let's, let's try to keep it engaging. So, you know, everyone, if you want to ask questions in the chat, I'll be monitoring the chat or just, you know, unmute, feel free to unmute and just, you know, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, uh, Donna, uh, Miss, Mrs. Schieffer. Um, yeah, um, we will, sh we'll definitely share the, the link to the recording on the um, email when we're done. So thank you so much. And I, and I did an outreach email today. So cool. Um, Awesome. Well, let's begin. So Eliza, and I thought it was pretty funny. So, hey there, Eliza. What's it like in that there? Well played. It's a biome production. So, you know, sit back, relax, make sure your seat's buckled and your hands are staying inside of the vehicle at all times. There we go. One thing too um, is please fill out this form. We like to keep track of who's here. And if you are here for another reason and you didn't get the outreach email, this form will be used um, in order to put you onto the outreach email later in which any of this kind of community outreach thing goes on, you'll be, you'll um, be able to get an email about it. Alan, if you could put that in the chat, that'd be great. It's the same form as we've been using in the past. Um, cool. 
Um, awesome. So what is an ELISA? That's probably your first question. So it's an acronym. It means an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And here's a nice picture of kind of like what that is really entailing. So you got your, your immunosystem there. You got your kind of thing that's going to help you assay. You got your, this is the enzyme-linked, I guess, part here. And then you got the, the thing you're looking for. We'll get into much more detail about this, but this is just in the beginning. Again, enzyme-linked, always important. Immunosorbent, that immuno is super important. And assay, you're using it to quantify things. You're using it to study how much of whatever material do I have. So we'll go in a little deeper here. So to understand an ELISA, we must first understand ourselves. So if someone can type in chat, please, what is an antigen? And if you are feeling courageous enough, um, how does your body respond to it? So I'll give you like a minute, um, give some answers, throw them out there, and I'll see what people got. And if no one has anything, that's okay. Uh, we know what, I think we know. And no wrong answers here. Yeah, cool. Part of bacteria virus, cool. Antigen is like a protein or something. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to butcher names, and I'm so sorry about that. I, I, can't, I can barely talk when I'm normally speaking, so proper nouns are a struggle. But Gian or Gianni, you got it right. An antigen is a pretty much anything foreign to the body, and it's perceived as a toxin. So like everyone's saying, bacteria, virus, those are antigens. Um, and so your, your body's going to have an immuno response to it. And that immuno response is this here, antibody. And so when we look back at what an ELISA is, it's using, ooh, don't not look forward, look back. We're using these antibodies in order to bind to antigens. So let's say we had a virus we want to see if someone had, or we have a sample from someone and we want to see if there's a virus there. Well, one way we could see that virus is running an ELISA on the, the sample and seeing if the, uh, if the antibodies would bind to it and then produce a signal. And so that's kind of like the basic understanding of ELISA, these antibodies binding to antigens. And it's what your body does all the time. You ever get sick, you got antibodies. You eat peanut butter and you really shouldn't have antibodies. They're everywhere. And they're gonna, and they're gonna bind to these antigens. An important thing also is the structure. Don't worry too much about the specifics of the structure because I don't even know all the specifics of the structure. It's a very, very complicated system. But just know this part here, this little branch part, they're what bind to your antigens. So if you make a Y, and then this body part is they kind of help signal to other antibodies or cells to bind to things and react with things and stuff like that. That's what they do in your body, but it's going to be important later. So this is called your F sub AB. Um, and these are the arms that will bind to the antigens. And then you have your, your FC. And, and don't worry about those sub letters there, just crystallization and like A binding or something like that. But just know kind of what their purpose is in general. And so the antigens, the FAB um, arms are made specifically for specific antigens. So you can see, let's say this one's like H1N1. Let's say this is COVID. Well, this antibody is not for COVID, so it's not gonna bind to COVID. Great, awesome job. Cool, let's keep going. So there are many types of ELISA. There's direct, there's competitive, there's reverse, there's sandwich, there's indirect, competitive, so on and so forth. The one that most common though, and the one we're going to look at today is the sandwich. Um, and the reason why it's kind of common and why we're going to look at it is when we're talking about identifying viruses, um, you want something that's super specific. And out of all these, the sandwich is the most specific. And we'll see why we call it a sandwich. If people want to take guesses in the chat um, on why you think that we call it a sandwich. Um, I could go for it. I want, to, I want to see some guesses because I had no clue when I first started researching this stuff. Maybe it's because it's got turkey and provolone. Maybe a little lettuce. And if no one knows, that's fine, because I had no clue. Well, I'll show you. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, oh, Cooper. Cooper, you got it right on. Exactly, it's a sandwich. You make a sandwich with antibodies. So here's your bread. And I mean, what's your favorite type of bread? You got your wheat, and then you got your fillings. So yeah, so the sandwich, uh, ELISA, works where you have this antibody, antigen, antibody, antibody, kind of coupled together. Super cool, 
super specific, so on and so forth. So yeah, cool. So that's really quick. So let's go into the individual steps of what's going on here. So what is a capture antibody? So this capture antibody is this first antibody that you're going to bind to the bottom of your well. So imagine you have this kind of rectangle with a bunch of little wells in it. I'm sure you've maybe seen something like it before. Um, you're gonna put a nice liquid in there and you're gonna put these antibodies to bind to it. So these are charged and usually they're charged in the same way. If you watched last week's um, webinar, uh, Alan talked about one way that you can cause charges on proteins um, in which you introduce different pHs, you introduce a wash to them in order to charge them. And so they bind better to the bottom of the polystyrene well. Um, they're also polyclonal. So polyclonal is a fancy term for antibodies that can bind to you know, different things. They're not very specific, um, but these are the ones you're going to find in your body. They come from your B cells, your T cells, a bunch of different varieties of them. There's also monoclonal, and we'll talk about monoclonal different uh, later, but polyclonal will bind to different epitopes on your antigens. So I have a question for you all. So why do you think they're going to use polyclonal rather than monoclonal as the capture body? So why is the first antibody going to be polyclonal? And why not make it monoclonal? If you have questions about that, fire away. I accidentally muted myself. Yeah. We need another, we need an M here, a C here, and an A here to finish the song. Um, yeah, so I'll just continue. So the, the polyclonal, the reason why you're going to use that is because you don't really want to be hyper specific on just getting the antigens to bind to the bottom. You want to kind of collect as many antigens as possible. Um, and you're going to introduce the specificity later. Um, and so you're going to use a polyclonal uh, capture antibody. Again, bind to different epitopes on the maybe the virus or whatever antigen. And we'll talk about what these epitopes look like uh, later when we talk more specifically about viruses. So step two, this one's pretty simple. You add your antigen. So here's your, the bottom of your well, you just bring in your antigens and they're gonna start binding. If there's antigens present, if not, maybe they won't bind and not all of them are gonna bind. Now step two, a new antibody has entered the chat. So like I said, these antibodies, they're gonna be monoclonal. So they're gonna be a little more specific. They're gonna to bind to specific epitopes and they're all gonna be the same. Um, and the way they make these, these are lab made. You don't get these kind of naturally. Monoclonal are made in lab very specifically to, to work at, in assays or work for diagnostics. Um, and so they, they bind very, very specifically and they're all identical. Great question. So we'll talk a little more specifically about washing, but, um, when you're doing an experiment, if I started just mixing all of my uh, different kind of solutions together, you're going to get a lot of extra things. Not every, not every antigen is going to bind. Not every uh, uh, antibody is going to bind. Um, and so you want to wash the ones that don't bind away. So great question. Um, cool. So yeah, so, so great. So yeah, so these are super specific, hyper-specific, and this is how you get your specificity. Um, and again, they're lab made and they're used in all different kinds of diagnostics. This technology is across the board, cool. Um, and so I have a question for you. So what, what's, what is this purpose of the enzyme linked? Again, to the, the kind of more main part of the body. What does that enzyme do? Why is it enzyme linked? I mean, in my mind, we've already, we've already bound the antigen. We got it sandwiched. What's the enzyme doing? It's not really doing anything there. So what do you guys think? Why do you think it, this, this antibody needs to have enzymes linked to it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So a lot of times enzymes do that. There's, there's a different reason though. Um, if we look here, the enzyme's not binding to the antigen. It's only the antibody. So what would you maybe do with the enzyme? If you have more guesses. And thank you for typing chat. Mark location. Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so good. So yeah. And so we'll talk a little bit more specific about the specific enzymes used, but it's pretty much mark location or mark the amount of density you have there. 
how many antigens are there in this well plate? And why is that important? Let's say, you know, uh, maybe I have got only one antigen. If I, if I only have one antigen, then only one antibody is going to bind to it. And, you know, this sample maybe has like thousands and thousands of the capture antibodies. It's barely going to show. You know, the, the goal of this is going to be pretty much to change color at the end of the day. It's still going to be pretty clear. Now, let's say I have 950 antigens bound to my 1,000 uh, capture antibodies. Well, now that's going to get really dark blue. So marking location is good. And it, it's pretty much that. You're going you're gonna to produce a signal that we can read later to see how many antigens you have. And maybe, you know, are you, do, you, do you carry the virulent um, to a degree which is dangerous? Things like that. So great job, guys. Thank you for uh, engaging. Really appreciate it. Okay, right, now we have substrate time. So we'll talk more specifically about enzymes in a second. Um, but you're going to pretty much add the substrate, and it's going to do exactly what I talked about just a second ago. It's going to be your signal and quantification detection. So the enzyme is going to interact with the substrate and produce a signal. Um, any questions on any of those steps? Um, just fire them off in the chat, and we'll continue. Um, because we're going to be talking about this kind of basic setup for quite a bit longer. So I want to specifically talk about what an enzyme is in order to make sense of this. So an enzyme works with a substrate and you've got a protein. And so go off and chat and, and get a couple messages in there and, and describe what an enzyme is and what's the main goal of an enzyme. If you can answer that question. Enzymes are super important, yeah. Create new pathways with lower activation energy for reactions. Good, yeah, good. That, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, enzymes lower active, yeah, awesome. And so do enzyme, yeah, good. So they're gonna, they're gonna lower activation energy for, is it a specific reaction, many reactions? Do you guys know specific reactions or are there different reactions? Specific, yeah, yeah, they kind of work in one way, right? But you have many different enzymes to do that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and so what they do is they're gonna catalyze reactions pretty much. Whether in this, in this instance, they're, they're probably doing a, a, a lysis of, of the substrate. So you're bringing a water molecule and breaking this, this product up. Um, and, you, and you have this kind of complex with it. So awesome job. Let's continue. So ignore this. Um, imagine, so this little back is like a bacteria and like, it's like a worm parasite in like bugs, but I couldn't find one for like a virus that had this good of an image. So just imagine this says COVID-19 or H1N1, and then we're good. So here's a very common enzyme and substrate, substrate mix that we're going to see in ELISA all the time. You're going to have this horse radish, radish peroxidase. Um, it's a enzyme that we source from the roots of horse radish. A hard word to say, I can't say that three times fast. And what it does is it oxidizes things. Um, it, use, it, it will use hydrogen peroxide to oxidize these things. And so it will change, let's say our, our, our substrate solution, we can have a ton of different things depending on what we want. We could have um, TMB red, which is colorless, but then you oxidize it and it becomes this bright red color. You can have it blue when there's nothing there, but if it reacts and it's a yellow and you can detect for those things. And like we talked about earlier, ignore that. Um, with this, the amount that's in there is going to change the amount of color, right? So the, the darker the color, the more antigen you have in there. And you know it's a more positive read and maybe not just um, an accidental, within the bounds of error, accidental binding that there shouldn't have been a binding to happen. Because like I said, these, uh, you know, they're all proteins. They don't know what they're binding to. They do it structurally. I, don't, I didn't say that, but I'm saying it now. They, they do it all structurally. So they just look at the shapes and everything fits like a puzzle piece, but they're not conscious. They don't know what they're binding to. They're just binding. And so mistakes happen, but the probability is low. So we use this as indicators for it. Awesome. Yeah, so here's our well play. And so this is a different method. This is a, a direct binding, indirect. This is kind of a similar LISA where um, we're gonna talk about this method too, where you'll have your antigen bind to the bottom, you'll have this primary antibody bind to it, and then using its crystallized arm, I guess, um, bind in a secondary that just carries the signal. Um, and the reason why you do this 
is because you don't really want to mess with this antibody too much because it's built, like people don't really add the enzyme linked to a specific antibody that's specific to a certain uh, um, type of uh, antigen. Um, however, this, like I said, in the body, these are used often to signal to other antibodies or cells. And so they're a little more general. And so it's easier to bind than a, a conjugate um, secondary antibody. Yeah, this is going to show a couple. So yeah, so that's cool, but what's, what, what's a virus, you know? So a virus, we're gonna talk a little more specifically. I think viruses are neat, they're super relevant, they're why you're home right now, and they're why we're all home right now. So viruses need other organisms to replicate. They'll invade organisms, they'll hijack your systems in that central dogma of biology. If anyone wants to chime off what that central dogma is, go crazy, please do. And it's good to memorize that because that's how you're going to think about everything for the rest of your life if you're a microbiologist. Um, and like some of you mentioned earlier, one way that antibodies find, yeah, thank you, Mia, that's exactly right. Um, one way that um, antibodies work is binding other proteins. And so they have this protein coat around them. And that protein coat is what antibodies are going to know this virus by. This is what they're going to evolve their, their, their arms that bind to it to bind these proteins. And so that's why you've been maybe hearing in the news lately, oh, um, like 25% of New Yorkers, I, I made that number up, I don't know what the actual number was, have these antibodies um, in their system, even though they never showed COVID-19 symptoms. Well, it's because they probably had COVID-19 at some point, um, and they, they produce these proteins to deal with it, to have an immune response to it. Um, healthier people can respond better and maybe not even ever show symptoms, so on and so forth, or younger people, um, which also tend to be healthier. Um, they also, so they're, they're gonna code proteins. Like I said, they don't come, they come with the building blocks. Um, they need to use other organisms in order to spread themselves. And so that really is going to, the, the amount of proteins they code for um, really depends on the type of virus. Um, your, your influenza viruses, your flu, um, We'll code, we'll code for tens of proteins, but some bigger ones will code for over a hundred proteins. It really just depends on the type of virus. Um, but usually they don't code for that many because you wanna be efficient. You wanna get into that cell, build up a bunch. And the way they, they kill cells is kind of gross. They, they build their cells up a bunch, a bunch, and then they break the cell. And then they're all over into your other cells and so on and so forth. Scary. So here's a picture of one. And we're gonna talk about these little pro, project, project projections off of this uh, body um, because it's super important in classifying proteins. So I'm going to use the example of the flu. Um, it's super well studied. We know all about it. Um, it's better study than like uh, your coronaviruses and things like that. So we're, we're going to stick with flu. So there's three types. There's A, B, C. And if we have time, I'll talk to you a little bit more about what those three types are and how they're different. Um, and they have a single stranded RNA in them. So based off that, I, I'm going to let you guys kind of, you know, maybe take a, a breather, take a step back. Um, why do you think that they have RNA in them? What are they going to use that RNA for? It's a, it's a tricky question. It's a tricky question. But if you look at Mia's answer, um, we, can, we, can, we can logic our way through this figure it out as a group. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, I see, I see. Join the cells DNA, yeah. I see a bunch of good answers. Yeah, they're, they're, they're going to work themselves. They're going to kind of hijack that central dogma. Um, the specifics depend on the virus. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the RNA structure of your flu virus and how that works, whether it's a positive strand or a negative strand and what that means. Um, but y'all essentially got the answer correct, which is super awesome. Good biologist. Um, they're going to you know, force the cell. They're going to hijack maybe the DNA put themselves in there and insert themselves in there. They're going to hijack ribosomes and make sure that they copy the types of things they want. Now, let's look at this protein here or protein capsule virus situation. Um, 
what kind of proteins do you see that are, are going to need to be replicated? What, what needs to be in that RNA? What, what does the RNA need to code for? If you guys got some of those answers. So we know how it does it and you know, why it needs to hijack a cell, but, but what, what does it need? Yeah, receptors on the protein code. Good. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely one of them. What else? The code itself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're going to need the code and the receptors. I got, I've, there's one trick one, too. I, I've got it in my head because this picture does not show what it is. And so I'm being a little unfair. Um, cytoplasm. So yeah, um, there's going to be, so yeah, there's going to be stuff inside the virus for sure. Um, cytoplasm's like, you're, you're going to have proteins in there, but not really cytoplasm itself isn't a protein and RNA is going to code for protein specifically. So what kind of protein specifically are we looking for? And there's one that has to do with RNA. Um, if you guys can think of it, it's a, it's a trick question because it's, you can't, you can't look at this image and find it. Yeah, no, that RNA polymerase is definitely there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good one. Um, yeah, good. Um, you're going to need a code for things that you're going to use in the cell. Um, and then, and, and then later deal with that. Uh, spliceosomes also a good, uh, good guess. Um, a lot of times though, um, Viruses don't really need to use spliceosomes because they're so simple. Um, they can just code for the protein and they're, they're not very long. Um, but one thing also they're going to code for is within this uh, cell, uh, in the virus capsid itself, you're going to code for these like almost like histone-like objects and histones kind of wind DNA up. And so once this, this virus is done coding for itself over and over, these proteins are going to bind to the RNA, wind it back up, put it itself in the capsule, get ready to eject out of the cell and go, go to other cells in the body. And get ready to be a pirate once more. Um, awesome job. And thank you everyone too for engaging. But yeah, polymerase is a good one. There's other things too you're going you're gonna to want to bind for to help you get across there. And we can maybe talk about those a little bit more later. All right, I'm moving my group chat. So, so we're going to talk about virus type A. Virus type A is the most common one. Um, we see it all the time. It's your H1N1s. And so I forgot to talk about here. So glycoproteins. So glycoproteins, um, type A and B are classified by glycoproteins. Your CDs, um, not your music CDs, but your virus CDs. <laughs> um, they're not classified by glycoproteins. Um, and so these are th these little proteins protruding off this wall here, or the, the capsid, are your glycoproteins. Um, they use, they're used for a bunch of different things. They're used to signal. They're used to guard themselves um, from detection. That's kind of one of the main ones. Um, but they also serve a purpose. They will bind to the cell. Um, they'll then dig into the cell because you got to inject, you have to inject your RNA somehow. And so they'll use these glycoproteins to capture your cell um, and, and swing on into it. If you want to think of it like a pirate, I like that analogy. I've been watching Pirates of the Caribbean over quarantine. So here's your Jack Sparrow on his black pearl. Um, so you have two different types of, of glycoproteins. You've got H and N. So the hemagglutinin is a glycoprotein, and this is the one that binds to the cell. It's going to target a cell and have specific binders. It'll bind to maybe other glycoproteins because your cell has glycoproteins. It needs to signal. It needs to bind to other cells. It needs to signal to other cells. What, what the hell's going on in me? You know? And so it'll hijack that system. It knows. Um, you've got then, I'm going to butcher their name, neuraminidase, which that ACE should clue you off. It's an enzyme. It's going to do something. It's going to catalyze some reaction. Um, this is going to pretty much inject the RNA into the cell. Um, it's going to break down the cell wall, so on and so forth. So you have this amount of subtypes is debatable. Um, the, the information I got, um, talked to UTL about it, 16 to 9. You know, you have 16 uh, H's, you got nine N's, but you're going to find other information somewhere else. Maybe there's, I think the one I, I also saw was they classified 11 and 19. Um, they're, they're classifying new ones, not super often. They, so on the side, I guess, um, 
we know all the types of H's and N's in avian species. We've got those classified. We know what those look like. Um, however, avian species who get this don't really show any symptoms. Um, and so it's really not a big deal that they get them. And so we can really kind of mess around with it with them. Um, in mammals though, you'll, you'll show more symptoms, so on and so forth. You maybe get epidemics or pandemics. Um, and so this like 16 N thing is, is debated more about the mammal species. Just an aside, um, because better to know more, right? So yeah, so that's your virus. So now let's imagine we have the H1N1 virus. So I don't know what they actually look like, but let's say this is your H's, let's say these are your N's. So this is the subtype one, subtype one. And so we're dealing with swine flu. So I say, come here, uh, Alan, how you doing? He sneezes on me. I'm like, you son of a gun, you just sneezed on me. We're, we're gonna see if you got this, this virus in you. And so we're gonna run an experiment. Again, there's different types of ELISAs. We're gonna do kind of a modification of the uh, sandwich ELISA. Um, we're gonna do a modification of the sandwich ELISA um, that was kind of developed for diagnostics specifically to be efficient, so on and so forth. And this was used, uh, I don't know, I forget which researcher came up with it, but from a Stanford lab, so go Cardinal. So let us begin. So we're gonna have 12, let's say we have 12 well plates and we're gonna label three for positive control and three for negative control. And then we're gonna have six ones for our different samples. So asking this as you're, as you're, you're gonna use your scientific mind as your research mind, why do we need positive and negative controls? What, what's the purpose of a positive and negative control? Uh, and you're going to use them every experiment you should do. You should have a positive and negative control. So if anyone's got any ideas, hit me up in my chat. Yeah, yeah, shows what a positive result looks like. Yeah, exactly, right? You know, so for example, and let's say we're, we're testing, we're, text, we're testing Alan for H1N1. I don't want him to be sick. Um, good, yeah, good, you're comparing your samples to your control. So what would be in the positive control? What would I need in there to make sure it's gonna get a positive response? Again, I'm, I'm testing Alan, I think he's sick. Thank you, Alan, for being a, my example. You're, you're a trooper. Um, yeah, exactly, it's gonna be H1N1 antigens. You're gonna have some, uh, uh, some liquid, some solution. I always forget the word solution, so bear with me. Um, you're gonna have some solution that's gonna have a bunch of antigens in it, and that's your positive control. Now your negative control, you don't want a response to your negative control. You wanna show that your, your, your antibodies aren't binding random willy nilly. Um, and you wanna compare it to what it looks like when there's nothing there. You're gonna run some statistics on it once our, our well plate reader is done reading it. Um, and so your negative control is usually just purified water. Nothing in it. Yeah. And so that's, you're gonna use that every experiment, I promise you. So getting that logic down is always important. Thank you for engaging. <laughs> you, I'm, I'm gonna test you, I swear, I swear. I swear on the Lord above. All right, so now we're gonna add our controls and our samples. So what we do first is just add 50 microliters. Make sure you add it to the ones you labeled because you don't wanna forget. Um, I know you, you think, you're, you, think you, you, can, you figure out everything, but when you got a 96 by 96 and you forgot to label, uh, you're sweating. You have no clue what's in any of those wells. So make sure you always label and you add it to the right ones. Another important thing is you always change your pipette tip. You don't want to cross contaminate. You ruin the experiment, right? You ruin your controls, you ruin your samples. And so um, add your three controls, add this. Um, and we're just using 50 microliters. This is kind of what's used in these smaller well plates. Um, but depending on maybe the amount of antigen you expect or the size of your well plate, that 50 isn't a fact. It's more of just like, we want to make sure we have enough and it fits in our experimental size. Uh, cool. And so getting on to the question we had earlier, I forgot who asked it. My 
bad. Oh, wait, not yet. <laughs> One more step, and then we'll talk about washing. So we're going to add the antigen now. And so in this model, it's similar to the one where I talked about with the worms, if you remember way back when, in which, so microplates are made out of polystyrene. These kind of have a charge. Um, and so hydrophobic or nonpolar, or they have an absence of a charge, my bad. Hy hydrophobic or nonpolar, and also an absence of a charge, um, antigens will bind to it. They're proteins. You know, each little individual amino acid, each residue has its own charge. Um, and so the nonpolar ones are going to start binding to it, and you're going to get them to bind on the bottom. Um, and then from there, um, you should, again, have antigens in the positive control always binding to the bottom because it's your positive control. And then in your different samples, you maybe have them bind to the bottom. You don't know. They're too small to see. But an example of kind of more of a graphic of what that would look like is you take it from your sample and add it in. So you're just adding in, um, you know, I guess this would be in your samples if the antigens are in there, more kind of that logic. Hope that makes sense. Um, now we're going to wash. And so I, you already preempted a question I had, why are we washing and why is it important? Um, you need to wash to remove the extra, you know, if you later when you add the antibodies, if I didn't wash, let's say my positive control, um, you know, I'm not gonna know what's binding or let's say I have a sample and let's say not all the antigens bound to my sample. Um, you're going to then later have free floating, weird, uh, um, secondary antibodies binding to them. And you just don't want that. You want to know what's going on. You want a, a nice hard science. And those free floating antibodies may signal off in a, in a different way. You, and they may signal off even when they're not bound. So you always are washing. After every different solution you add, you're going to wash. And so I call it gravity drying because you use gravity to dry it. And so you'll put in uh, a washing buffer. And washing buffers are usually detergents. Um, not that dissimilar from the detergents you use to wash your clothes. Um, and they will clear out everything. Um, and then you put them on a paper towel, you maybe tap them a little bit, not, not vigorously, but you know, just on the sides. Um, and, then, and then you're ready to um, add your wash buffer, and then you do the same thing with your wash buffer. And you're gonna see this gets pretty repetitive because you're gonna need to do this after every step. So, yeah. Um, so Andrew asked, what if an engine is not hydrophobic and polar? Ooh, good question. So that's one way, that's another thing we talked about um, earlier. So what we could do is then use our capture antibodies and use an actual sandwich. And so you could have your capture antibody bind to it and then the antigen can bind to it. Um, that's one way to think about it. Um, you could have another way where you introduce a buffer with the antigen and that buffer would interact with the antigen in order to change um, its kind of net charge. Because if, um, if you want to look at last week's webinar, Alan did a whole long lit, uh, talk on how you can actually change proteins charge based on the pH. Um, and so you could do that. Um, another way to think about it too is there's probably going to be, uh, a, a, these antigens aren't usually that small. There's going to probably be a significant amount of nonpolar residues on it. And the way proteins usually structure themselves is a lot of times they'll structure themselves in which they'll fold, right? Because they got that 3D kind of way of folding. They'll fold to have nonpolar residues exposed to the outside. So it could happen. Most of the time, there's going to be nonpolar residues there to, to bind to places, especially if you're in like a water solution and things like that, which they tend to be in because they're in your cytoplasm. Um, and then also, um, you could always use a different ELISA um, to tackle that problem. But that's a great question. Um, and thank you for asking. Yeah, so I'll just add a small bit on top of that. Yeah. Um, as Colin mentioned, there are many different ways to bind your antigen to the, um, to the plate itself. But there are other ways as well. You know, there's many different ways. One other way is you can coat the bottom of the plate with something called streptovidin. And then you can also um, add a biotin tag to your antigen. And the biotin will actually bind to the streptovidin. And that can also help stick it to the plate. So there's many different chemical ways to, to modify. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, great. And so, yeah, so this problem has come up before. Um, great. Uh, so now we're adding our first primary antibody. It's all coming together now. And so you're gonna add this primary body to each well. You hope it binds to your positive controls. You hope it doesn't really bind to anything in your negative controls and you, depending on your sample, you know, I don't want Alan to be sick. Hopefully it doesn't bind, but he's coughed on me too. So I have two samples. I'm also testing myself. 
Um, and you're going to let it sit for five minutes. You're kind of letting it mix. You're letting the sauce stew a little bit um, and let it bind and let it react because it's not just going to go like that. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so it's all coming together. So I included the meme. Uh, I feel like I'm a boomer now. So <laughs> and we'll continue. We're going to do it again. We're going to wash it again. Again, you always got to wash. Um, there's many experiments I've ruined because I forgot one step of washing. It could be, there could be like 20 steps to the experiment. You, you forget to wash in one or two of them. Your experiment's ruined. You can't count it. So very rigorous in washing. It's very important. Um, so you're going to wash it the same way, same style. Pour out the solution in there. Take your uh, washing buffer uh, and then dry it out again. Let it dry for a bit. And then you're going to add another secondary antibody. And remember what this looks like. I don't know if you can see my, can you see my hands, Alan? Cool. So you're going to have, you know, your antibodies here. Uh, it's going to be like that because it's binding to the antigen at the bottom. And then you're going to have it come back and bind like that. And then the enzyme is going to be in like one of the bunny ears. So that's the way it's going to look. And now you can even have more. Um, you know, if you saw it at the beginning, you could have antibody, antigen, antibody, antigen, or it's not antigen, antibody, antibody. And you use those many different antibodies for the same reasons as I talked about before. They're made kind of specifically. You use those monoclonal antibodies to bind to the antigen because we want very, we want high specificity. We don't want misbinding because other things are going to bind to the bottom. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and it's, um, so it's one I, I kind of talked about earlier. So those primary antibodies are highly specific. They're built for one thing and they're built to bind to those antigens. Um, if you start introducing other things into it, you can kind of change that structure and make it less efficient and it's just harder to do. And so we have a really easy way of just making sure that you have this antibody that binds to this antigen. And then we have more general other antibodies that bind to just antibodies in general. And so that's kind of what we use. We use a highly specific monoclonal antibody to bind to the antigen. And then we just use these general antibodies that bind to just kind of any antibodies in general depending on like what animal and stuff it's from, because we get antibodies from animals and it'll bind on top of that. Great question. Um, yeah. And so you don't want to enzyme link it. And also the way that it's structured, the enzyme link, it'd be hard to link it to the, the, the FC part of it. So you want to link it there. But yeah. Click. Okay, there we go. And now we have all the ingredients. So, um, like I said, the secondary antibody is the enzyme-linked antibody. It's more general. It doesn't need to be specific for the antigen. You can kind of see what that looks like. Um, and it should, it should bind to the only primary antibodies because it's, a, it's almost like an anti-antibody. It's looking for antibodies to bind to. We have everything here, but we need to add one thing. So we're going to wash away any free secondary antibody. And we wash it three times. I added the S's because I don't know why. Uh, why wash it three times? Can I get some answers in the chat? I'm gonna start a game show after this. I don't think I have the TV presence for it, so. The good stuff, I like the good stuff. Yeah, we're only left with the good stuff. Yeah, exactly. We got our ingredients in the pot. We only want the stuff on the bottom, exactly. You want to make sure you don't have any free floating secondary antibodies because let's say, let's close your eyes. We're going to do a thought experiment. Let's say in my, in my sample, Alan wasn't actually sick. We know this. We have a omnipresent view on Alan's life and body and his inner workings. And we know for a fact he's not sick, but I didn't wash it enough. And in my little solution there, I had a bunch of secondary antibodies just floating around because I washed it once. Now, one wash is probably good enough, but let's say, you know, I left 10% of them in there. And every time you wash, you get 90% of them out. So 10% are still in there. And I add the substrates. Well, the secondary antibodies are still going to interact with the substrates. They don't need to be bound to anything. And they're going to cause a signal. And so I'm going to get this reading back in, you know, me being in my lab and my, my minimal, my view on the world. I'm not omnipresent. I'm going to think Alan's sick. I'm going to give him medicine he doesn't need. Waste of money, waste of time, maybe hurt Alan because that medicine, you know, sometimes hurts people if it's trying to help in other areas. Just bad news bears. So we gotta wash a bunch. We gotta get it out of there. We wanna make sure our readings are correct and accurate. That's the point of science, baby. That's it. Now we're gonna add this substrate. 
um, and we're gonna wait five minutes. We're gonna let it react, we're gonna let it sit there. We're not gonna wash this time. Well, we're gonna wash when we're all said and done, or you're just gonna toss the well plate, depending on uh, how expensive your lab is. If they got lots of money, they'll just break those over their knees and then throw them away to, to laugh at the poor labs. But it depends. Uh, and this is what it's gonna look like. And so at the end of the day, we're gonna get this reading. Now you look at this, you, you know, this is a really pretty reading. It's not gonna look like this. You're gonna have a little blue here. You're gonna have a little blue here. Maybe your negative control has a little blue, but that's okay if it does have a little blue um, because like some, sometimes maybe at the base hole rate, it's a little blue and you just gotta compare it. You know, it's in all in comparison to this. So um, we can see, you know, let's say this is Alan, uh, this is me. And then let's say like five days later, this is Alan and this is me. Then it's 10 days later, Alan, me. Then Alan got sick again, so on and so forth. Um, we would know, and that's a, this is like a perfect well, uh, well reading. It's not gonna look like this, but if it did, you did great. Awesome. And so that, and that's it. That's kind of how we're gonna run those experiments. Um, once you get the muscle memory down, those go by pretty quick. They're not very difficult. So there are other methods to do it. Um, a lot of times, um, and this is what they're using for COVID right now, um, they use RT, R, they use R, RT, PCR. And that little R there is just real time. So it's happening right now in front of you, just like this stream is. Um, and then RT does not mean retweet. It means reverse transcriptase or reverse transcription, reverse transcriptase is the enzyme. And then PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction. Um, and so what you do is you introduce the RNA, the RNA is going to then be reverse transcribed into a, a, a DNA, and then you're gonna measure for those DNAs. And you'll know, right? You'll know based on like, let's say uh, Alan has a lot of RNA virus in his cells. Well, we'll know then by our, our RT-PCR. The thing is, these aren't usually performed in doctor's offices, offices, and they usually take a couple days to do. Not very fast and efficient. Um, Usually because with the flu and other things like that, that tend not to be life-threatening depending on where you live, and depending on your, your privilege, um, we can go like a day or two without worrying about whether or not I'm diagnosed with the flu or not. Um, things like COVID, they've got this down to, they're, they're making this faster and faster where they can get you responses in a couple of hours. And sometimes they'll use different diagnostic, they'll use a preliminary diagnostic and then a secondary diagnostic to make sure their preliminary wasn't wrong. The preliminary may be less accurate than maybe uh, quantitative RT-PCR. And so that's what's used now. Kind of an expensive machine. So yeah, so that's, I'm going to go over more stuff in a second. I got extra slides, but that's kind of it for Eliza. That's all she wrote. That's all Eliza wrote for this. Um, so if you have questions, let me know in the chat. Um, you can kind of go over um, antibodies or anything like that. You can go over, uh, his name Gronk or something like that remember his new groove, whatever. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about viruses um, here in a second because it's on everyone's mind right now. And also it's just interesting stuff and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of money and research is put behind it, not even in times of pandemics, but also just in general. And so if you continue with biology, there's a good chance you're working with a virus at some point or a non-zero chance for sure. Yeah, would you ever use a loss if you didn't know what the antigen was, just like so you can capture the antigen to study it more? Uh, usually not. You're gonna have other tests for that. That's a great question. Um, uh, I don't know the names of those tests, but you're gonna have like, you're gonna use met more like things like mass spec in order to kind of characterize it. There's tests that look for the specific um, glycoproteins so on and so forth. ELISA, you're gonna to need to have the, the antigen because you're going to need to produce those primary antibodies that are really specific um, to those uh, antigens. But that's a great question. Yeah, uh, in the negative control, why don't you use another antigen to make sure your antibodies are specific? Um, that's a great question. Um, so one thing we'll know, let's say our control readings are off. Like let's say, um, our control is super, uh, our control is at like, let's say it's got, it's got a reading of five. That's not a reading you're gonna get, but let's say it's quantitatively, it's at a reading of five units. Um, and let's say our sample was at a reading of, of 16 or something like that. Uh, that's unlikely, right? We'll know then that our antibodies binding not specifically, we messed up somewhere, maybe we didn't wash it well enough, or maybe it's just a bad, like the antibody's gone bad. Um, 
And so that's how I know. We want the negative control to not have a reading because we want to know what it looks like in our well plate when there's nothing in there but just pure water. Um, because you're going to do quantitative comparisons to the fluorescence readings you're going to get. And you, wanna, you don't want it to compare like um, yellow to red um, in readings. You want it to compare uh, red to nothing. Um, because that, that is a more meaningful comparison. And you'll know more about it because you'll know. Yeah, you'll know what it looks like when there's nothing in there. But that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, to further elaborate on if you don't know what the antigen is, Mm -hmm. um, there is another type of ELISA I've heard about called oh, competitive wrong. ELISA. Oh, yeah, yeah. Continue. And then for competitive ELISA, I think the idea is you have, um, you know, multiple things that are trying to bind to it. And you, you don't necessarily have to know what the antigen is. But if you, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but the idea in competitive ELISA is um, you have a, some, some antibody that tries, that tries to bind to certain things. And then only if it gets stuck onto the plate after the washing, does it uh, have a reading. And so I think there are certain cases where that, um, where you don't necessarily have to know the specific structure of the antigen, but that's typically, um, it's typically recommended that you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll give you some uh, example use cases that are outside of diagnostics for ELISA. Um, one clear one is diagnostics. Let's say you're um, culturing cells and you want to culture, you want to see how, what, how like immune, immune responses change those like mammalian cells or something like that. Um, you'll use ELISA as a bunch in order to, to test for certain proteins um, you're looking for. Um, so let's say you're looking for like, so a, a really common immune response is TNF alpha. You want to make sure you're causing it, an actual response in your cells. You use an ELISA for TNF alpha. That's another example that's like purely wet lab, just more uh, disease modeling kind of thinking um, rather than diagnostics thinking. I don't know if that's helpful, but I said it anyways. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, cool. Any other questions or uh, I'll, I'll continue. We got like nine minutes left. So we'll just kind of talk about viruses in general. So I, um, I talked a little bit about virus type A um, again, mainly birds and mammals, mainly birds, a little into mammals. Um, and they they don't usually show symptoms in birds. Um, so it has a negative sense RNA. So this is what I was talking about earlier, where your RNA and the way it works is, um, makes sense. So if we go back to the central dogma thing, we can go back to what Mia said earlier, where you had DNA, RNA, protein. Now it's not just any RNA you're going to use. RNA is in everything. You have RNA in spliceosomes, you have RNA in ribosomes, you have RNA everywhere. You want messenger RNA. You want the, the direct product of when, um, you know, you, 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 uh, yeah, transcribe something, right? And so you're going to, you know, transcribe it from DNA to mRNA. And so what a negative sense RNA is, it's the complement to the mRNA. And so what you'll do is you'll hijack um, certain proteins or maybe build for your own proteins and you'll create a mRNA off of that, that negative sense strand. And you'll code in that RNA, uh, a hundred to a couple thousand base pairs long, and you'll code for a certain amount of proteins. And like I said, we talked about those proteins previously. You know, you got your many different um, capsids, your glycoproteins, so on and so forth, your polymerases. Good. We also have virus type B. Um, these infect mainly humans, but they're not, they usually cause only local, um, use the right term, local epidemics, um, because they're de they don't, mutate very quickly. So if you have them and your body starts dealing with them, your body's going to be chill. It's going to figure it out. It's going to be like, all right, we got this. And it's not going to mutate faster or fast enough to get away from your body's immune responses. We're, we're well away with the machines. You got to be better than that. Um, it also has, it has different subtypes, but it has the same kind of, it has the same protein structure, those H's and N's as your type A. It also has a single stranded negative sense RNA. So very similar to type A, but um, only causes mild diseases. Um, and doesn't usually spread very far. So the type A's are the ones you're going to get scared for. That's your H1N ones. Um, these are also influenza virus types. I realize that's not clear at the top, but just know that in your head whenever you think about this. Um, type C infect mainly human and pigs. Um, again, rare. They're very rare and usually only local. Um, has one kind of glycoprotein, which makes it very hard for them to evade. Um, 
detection because with one like right you're you, you know it's like a it's of a factorial if you have different glycoproteins and the different combinations you can have if you have one you have like let's see this can have nine different variants you only have nine right you don't have any pairing there um and that's the name of the the protein it works as a enzyme and as a detection protein um that's why you get the fusion and that's why it's called the hemagglutinin esterase so it will both bind to the cell and burrow into it um there are really not many vaccine i what i found was there's none i don't know if that's entirely true um but people don't worry about type c they don't cause you issues usually because like i said there's not much variation to them you you, you deal with one you can deal with a lot of them or you can detect a lot of them because you, you you detect based off those glycoproteins Cool. And then one last thing, um, got this from the UTL. Um, so why can't we just, yeah. You're gonna meet my cat maybe in a second. Please stay away, kitty. Um, so what determines how fast a virus can mutate? Um, that's a good question. So this is one of the ways we're gonna talk about is it. kind of viral reassortment. Um, I don't know the specific reason why type B mutates slower than type A. Um, but I do know that they specifically mutate slower when they're in the presence of like a, a human like biosystem or kind of microbiome, I guess. Um, but this is one way that viruses do mutate. Um, so you're preempting a good question in which you'll have a um, much similar to how you, you can have recombination in your DNA. Viruses will almost recombinate with themselves in which they'll swatch, swip, swatch, excuse me, swap out, uh, RNA um, or specific recombinate like kind of RNA. And so you'll start encoding for different glycoproteins for an example. Um, and so you, you'll see you have your H1N1 and then you have the H3N2. Maybe you have both of these in your system and all of a sudden they will start to fuse together or when the capsid forms, they'll take you know, a recombinated RNA with it. And now you have uh, a, different, a different strand, H1N2, um, H3N1. Um, you can you see how this can get kind of crazy depending on what you're, you're dealing with. Let's say I'm a bird catcher or a bird farmer and I'm, I'm around these viruses all the time um, and I've got my own in my body. Well, now we're going to get something scary and that's what happens. Um, thank you, Europe, I guess, for that one. <laughs> but yeah, so that was a great question. Um, if you want to look more, I, I recommend looking more into type B on, on virus mutation rates. Um, because I do not have an actual real good answer to that, but great question. Great question. So, yeah, so that's kind of like, oh yeah. And one thing is always get vaccinated. It's huge. You're going to need it. You can't fight these viruses by yourself. You want to know that they're here. Um, and that's kind of all I got for us today. Um, if we have any questions, please feel free. I, I can stick around for however long, um, and chat or whatever. Um, but thank you guys so much for showing up. Again, we'll be here next week. Um, next week will be Alan presenting. So get excited for that. Alan's, Alan's mega mind. Yeah, so, so next week I'm thinking about presenting on how to detect protein-protein interaction. Cool. So inside cells, you know, you have a whole bunch of proteins. You have this huge, you know, this huge pot, this mixture inside of your, each one of your cells, you know, there's enormous complexity. And then, I'm going to be talking about, well, how do biologists exactly know which protein interacts with which protein? You know, how do you know the pathways are inside cells? So that should be interesting as well. That does sound really good. I like that a lot. Um, I have a question, actually. So you know how when you it's get vaccinations, um, right. how, do, how do the doctors predict what type will be the next flu season? What, what kind of virus will there be in the next flu season? Yeah, that's a great question. That's like um, what they do. Um, and this is, I only have this, I haven't ever like really, I've talked to a doctor about this once and this is my information on this. Um, so there's new ways of doing it now because our, our computation's way better, but you can run models on based on, uh, various past, um, flus, maybe in animals or in humans, and you can kind of predict how they're going to recombinate. Um, you can use machine learning models for that. You know, if, if a bunch of pig stocks, let's say a bunch of pig stocks in like Me America, Mexico, and China, um, you saw this common virus and then humans three years earlier had H1N1 and the pigs and, and, and chickens or whatever had like 
the H through H three N two, you can kind of predict from there where it's going to go. Um, and they're not always right. Um, but you, you know, with a, a degree of certainty, you're correct usually. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. All right. Awesome. Oh, I'll stop recording too. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, yeah.